So recruitment at NAB had been um, segmented away from the HR function. It was actually in a shared services division of NAB. And it was, to be polite, fairly unsophisticated in its processes. So we would see um, lots and lots of hiring manager time spent on recruitment. And really, from a recruiter's perspective, it was bulk, compile, send. It was pretty much the extent of what the recruitment function were delivering for the business at that time. And needless to say, that meant that, no surprise, uh, turnover was really high. So on our frontline entry-level roles, you know, turnover was through the roof, way above industry norms, and quality of hire was hit and miss. Uh, and obviously our recruiters, they weren't really enjoying their jobs that much. It was pretty boring. So, yeah, that's kind of what we found. Yeah. So sure. how did you face into some of the challenges that Nina's been talking about? Yeah, so uh, we've been really lucky to uh, work with NAB in some areas within the business over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, so we work in areas like graduate recruitment. We did some selection testing for financial planners, roles like that. Uh, one day I got a, a call, I'm pretty sure it was like a Wednesday morning or something like that, saying, can you come in tomorrow to talk about digital assessments and a candidate experience Nina wants to see you? <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, that was an interesting meeting um, and Nina brought us in and sort of said, this is my vision, this is where I want to go, um, how can Test Grid help? Nina wanted a lot. <laughs> <laughs> she, wanted, uh, she wanted it mobile enabled, she wanted it predictive, it had to be digital, uh, it had to have an amazing candidate experience, it had to be branded, it had to, you know, these are... Magical fairy dust sprinkled yeah. across the internet. Which we yeah. have by the bucket load at Test Grid, but... <laughs> no, but uh, in all honesty, and you know, you've got to remember that these people are actually NAB's customers, so Nina's sort of trusting us to try and get a process that's, you know, really going to be good because if these cans are unsuccessful they're still potential customers yeah so we've got to get that right uh, so from there and uh, we came back in and we talked a little bit about what that was so again mobile enabled and valid and reliable i mean that's our core message and everything so and i'll just jump in kel so i think this is actually part of the story here is that it really was a partnership it's true i had lots of ideas lots of concepts ways that we could do it should do it what should we do and actually that's part of the story is here is that there were lots of phone conversations and lots of meetings going what about if we did this and what if we tried that and how could we hang it together like this so that's really you know something to be mindful of is that it's about the collaboration with your partners and who you work with so you can bounce ideas around and sort of say i've got crazy ideas over here how could we make that work or is this possible and that's you know part of you know really part of it and part of the success um, uh, the process now, uh, so from a pilot stage, we decided that we would, uh, candidates would uh, apply online uh, through the NAB e-recruitment system. Uh, then they would go through a cognitive assessment to check their mental abilities. Uh, then we would push them through to a, automatically push them through to a values questionnaire. So really looking for that culture fit or culture add to National Australia Bank. Uh, and then uh, automatically push those candidates who hit certain cri criteria straight through to a video interview. So which is really the first stage where we hope a uh, National State Bank recruiter gets involved in the process. It's interesting because one of the things we were trying to design was not to have any CV screen in the process at all. And that was quite radical, particularly yeah, for a bank to say, yeah. you know what, we're going to hire people and we're never going to see their CV. Because really, what does a CV tell you? At entry-level roles, frontline customer service or sales roles, what's a CV going to tell you? It might tell you what high school they went to or what university they went to, and maybe a couple of jobs have held early in their careers, if that's your demographic you're, you're targeting. But there wasn't really a whole lot else that the CV, we thought, was going to tell us about how capable someone was going to be at doing that job. What we wanted was smart people, so people that were going to be able to service the needs of our customers, that had the right values alignment, and then we used the video interview to assess communication skills, integrity, and resilience, because we knew these were key things that would help people be successful on the role. So, um, that was really the challenge that we put to Test Grid, was we almost want to uh, eliminate recruiter bias in the process. We want a process where we can rely on people's uh, abilities and natural ability, natural cognitive ability, and hire the best uh, people, you know, best talent we can find based on those things without, without looking at the CV. And then we take people through to an engagement centre. So an engagement centre uh, is a NAB-designed concept. Uh, and it flips the assessment centre methodology on its head. It says, we've gone through this process, this cognitive uh, sort of values assessment interview. We know we want, we want you. We want you at NAB. You'd be a great fit for our organisation. Now, do you want us? So it's taking that concept and saying, we're going to show you warts and all, what the job's like. We'll do a simulation. 
And then you can assess, is this job for you? Is NAB for you where you want a career? Through all this process, we were seeing huge numbers of dropouts in training school in the first three weeks because it was not what people were expecting. So by turning it on its head and saying, come and see what the job's all about, check it out, really check it out, you know, it was a great way to uh, make sure we built that psychological contract with people early on in the process. How did you engage the business and make sure that they were on board for you to be able to put something like this in? Yeah. Uh, there was three main things that actually made this successful from my perspective, and it would be good to hear yours too, Jared. Um, from my perspective, what made it successful was actually, first of all, the business and the courage from the business to go, OK, crazy HR lady, we'll give your process a try. They had to back it from a concept, but actually they also had to back it financially. So the business actually funded this model originally. Uh, it also required our HR colleagues to be advocates for what we were doing in TA and a new way of hiring people. And so that m meant really partnering with the HR people so they understood what we were trying to achieve and could advocate at leadership team meetings and with the hiring managers you know, over and over what we were doing, why we were trying to do it. And the third thing really was the TA team. So I really needed the TA team to be fully engaged in what we were trying to achieve. So that because they're the ones that were going to have to execute the process on a day-to-day -day basis, so their engagement in what we were doing uh, and being on board with that was really one of the keys to it actually being successful in the business. I don't think it's as easy as Nina maybe makes it sound. <laughs> so from an external vendor party working with a, a big beast like NAB, yeah. there's a few you know uh, T's that need crossing and I's that need dotting to make sure these you know these uh, four thirty Friday ideas kick off properly. <laughs> yeah, so we had. Uh, we did engage with procurement, IT, security, legal. Uh, page up, <laughs> legal, <laughs> and of course, right in the middle of the whole pilot, uh, our contract was expiring. Yeah, so course, to add all of those yeah. mixtures in, uh, that was uh, that was a really challenging time for us. Uh, but it was it was good because it is testament to the fact that it's a partnership. Yeah, so we we're able to say, okay, we've got this issue. We need to talk about security. What does this mean? This data center, that data center. What does that mean to NAB? What's the risk? and then managing that risk. And so we're lucky in many ways that we've partnered with NAB for a number of years that we were able to get through that. And with you know, Nina's vision as well, we've been able to see that it's worth it and build a business case to do it. We uh, wrote a case study uh, with NAB uh, based on the pilot. So we took a very, very conservative approach to the numbers because we know people like to challenge ROI figures. And particularly bankers or anyone like that, it, it could be difficult. So what we did is actually we looked at the calculation based on the number of successful hires through and then the reduction in turnover. And we took a very conservative figure of two times annual salary. So basically, to, to boil that down is, uh, based on NAB's volume of 1,300 or 1,400 hires, uh, if we can get 70 people to stay longer, uh, we're able to save NAB $7.2 million a year. That's the ROI. We haven't included hiring manager sat satisfaction, improvement in jobs, uh, customer satisfaction, all these other values that we will collect over time and then you know, keep bumping those numbers up. Uh, I think one of the EGMs actually turned around now, and this is the quote we love at TestGrid, is that uh, the candidates had NAB DNA. And for, to us, that just seems you can do all the research you want afterwards about the fact and the 7.2 million and all of that sort of stuff. But when a client says the candidates who are getting through to our, assess our engagement centers have our DNA, you know that you've done a good job. So it's been really, really good to work with NAB on that. Exciting. Yeah. yeah. One of the other benefits I should mention is that what we've noticed is that uh, the business used to spend hundreds of hours on recruitment when it was the bulk compile send you know, environment. The business did all the legwork. Uh, hours and hours they spent. Even in assessment centres, all the business would be there. They'd be doing the face-to-face -face interview, speed dating thing, and they spent hours on it. Now, actually, because TA delivered this service into the business, the business actually can get on with doing their business. And the team leaders can actually be there leading their teams. And the TA function are delivering great talent into the organisation. And that's fantastic. I think the productivity gain, you know, you put the financials aside, there's a huge productivity gain to be had for business leaders doing what they do best and letting TA do what we do best. A piece of advice, based on everything you've just talked about and everything you've been through, what would that be? And I'll start with you, Jared. Uh, start small. Just take one little area, trial it out in one area, and see, see what sort of results you get. Nina? Yeah, I'd say pilot something. Uh, have a go. It's, um, you know, build a business case in an area that you can influence and have really good relationships, because something like this requires uh, credible, uh, credibility and trust and those credible relationships to really make it work. And that's, that's the trick, is actually building those relationships in the business, uh, in the TA function with your, with your partners and uh, with your HR colleagues. So try somewhere, pilot somewhere, 
uh, it's, it's easy to implement once you've got those relationships in place. So that would be, that would be my advice. Sure. Uh, probably the best example I can give you is the Glassdoor reviews. So we, like many organisations out there, we monitor what's going on in Glassdoor. And what I can report is that within the pilot, within the first three months, is that candidates were giving us rave reviews actually about the engagement centre experience. The experience they were having there was new, it was different, it was refreshing. And so they were really enjoying engaging with NAB. Uh, so that's great. That was a real thumbs up. And it's at the moment um, still how we're measuring our candidate experience. Uh, well, I fundamentally believe that uh, in Tesco we're really passionate about things like diversity and unconscious bias, and so we research and look into it. And I think the more things that you remove out of a process like CVs, and the more you get closer to blind recruitment and those types of things, the actual better outcomes you will take. Take a pure data-driven approach. You know, I, I laugh uh, on Friday. There was a call into the office from a very happy customer for many years, but they had a marketing candidate who scored really badly on the verbal test. And we now, you know, 16 years of experience, we just went, okay, uh, hang on two minutes. And we went and looked at their LinkedIn profile and they couldn't spell Spanish. <laughs> and we went back to them and said, well, you know, they have an amazing CV, it looks amazing, they're in marketing, but if you look at their LinkedIn profile, it's disjointed, there's spelling mistakes on it. You know, the tests don't lie, the data doesn't lie. So, I mean, that's, I think that, yes, you can take away your biases and let the system sort of run the process. And if I can add, we're starting to look at how do we use this process for more senior roles, roles that require some kind of uh, technical background or skill and experience. So we're looking at how can we use the process, automate, have the automated part of the process up front, and then uh, do some skills assessment in the middle uh, to make sure people have that baseline skill. So if we're talking about... Um, it depends on your organisation. So I'll, I'll be totally open and honest. A lot of the stuff that we're doing and looking at now is actually, again, I, I got, I'm going to keep fo focusing on blind recruitment because I think that's the way everything is going. Um, because it, we, we're programming into the system now to look at things like the postcode that they're in and stuff like that to actually skew those. Because what happens in a normal recruitment process is your candidates apply and they'll either list alphabetically or by the time they logged in. But you can do some tweaks in your algorithms to talk about, you know, well, maybe we want people who have strived harder to get to this point. And that can be just a question on the survey or the entry point. Little tricks like that will actually level the playing field. And we're seeing this in research out of the UK as well that those sort of little things can help, yeah? Plus there's always the opportunity to flag any issues or raise those concerns, especially from an assessment point of view. So if you're talking about people with disabilities, the whole system has to, has to work in those situations. So there's a lot of things that your assessment provider should be able to do, like turn off the clock and turn off these things and you know blow up the screen and all those sorts of different things. Yeah, um, so I think it's fair to say that the GM of the business was quite open to hearing new ways of hiring because they wanted to solve their business problem. But probably it was the next layer down, so those sort of divisional area managers, leaders, they were probably the most resistant because they had the most skin in the game and the most to lose if it didn't, if it didn't work. And also it was their team leaders that really liked to hire their people, so they were the most resistant initially. Uh, and actually what I had to do was build a relationship with that GM uh, which required the coffee, Kel, mm -hmm. uh, and go to the leadership team meetings numerous times with the proposition, with the pilot, with the model, and talk to them um, about it and, and really sell it in. So it was very much a business case sell, building relationships, and it was also demonstrating that I really understood their business. I actually had to uh, really make sure I understood how the contact centre worked, what the levers were, what the issues were, so I could talk their language so that I could then sell the business case into them in their terms, not 
in HR or TA terms. Uh, and we've had to have lots of diversity, really, conversations with hiring managers. Uh, I've banned the phrase, I like them, because previously, you know, we'd go through a traditional process and you'd hear that a lot. You'd hear people say, I really like them. I, I can't bear it. It, it. it just reeks of kind of subjectivity. So now we say, that'd be good because. So now in the engagement centres, that's the language we use. That'd be good because. Um, so we encourage them in, we invite the line managers in, and then we say, in your training environments, if you've done great workforce planning, we've hired in a collective maybe 10, 12 people for an area, then we can look at how we distribute those in the business. So it's starting to drive other conversations around, yeah, resource planning and those types of things. Much higher. What's been super interesting is that we used to have the business used to over order, so they'd say we need ten bankers, um, but actually they, they'd order fifteen because we used to have people just not start. Since we introduced the pilot, a hundred percent of people started. That's that's awesome. That was a huge change for us. Uh, people actually turning up on day one into that training school. Uh, so again, that got back to. Uh, more rigour in the workforce management, workforce planning sort of space. As we could deliver on our promise, uh, the business has had to get more refined in how they've put those requirements forward. So that's been a really positive shift for the organisation as a whole. Yes, last question. Uh, my question is about your TA team itself. Okay. Um, you, you were saying the original process, not really loving life, bulk comparison. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that's a really great question. And I think it's one of the benefits that we don't talk about a whole lot of this pilot, but actually the overall engagement of the team we've seen shift dramatically. I've got a number of colleagues from NAB here who I'm sure can talk to you about it as well, that we've seen quite a shift. The team love it because they actually can add value now in a totally new way. Uh, they're not just, you know, sending stuff to hiring managers. They're actually watching the video interviews, which is, is fun. Yes, we have a high volume at NAB. We have a really high volume, but it's fun. And the engagement centres are really fun to deliver. We designed them to be fun. Actually, one of the principles in the design was it has to be fun, both for the candidates and for the recruiters. It's got to be got to be a great experience all round. So the team generally they're busy, they're flat out because we get you know lots of people. A we have lots of roles, and B we have lots and lots of candidates. Um, it's busy, it's full on, but the general energy level is much higher. Uh, it's a noisier environment, which is good. People, you know, we see things like unplanned absenteeism drop in the team, those kind of things, because people are much more engaged in their role and enjoying, you know, life at TA and NAB. <laughs> I'm Thanks, just Tom. gonna wrap that because we are at time. These guys are obviously available for questions if you want to come up and grab them. Thank you both so much for Thank sharing. You. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.